And we are live. I am Justin, also known as the DIY Audio Guy, and I am joined, as always, with uh, my buddy Nick from Toyd's DIY. Do you, are you going by Toyd now? That's what your little name badge says on the screen. I, I don't care what you call me, Toyd, Nick, whatever. It doesn't matter. My, our viewers know me as Nick and Toyd, whatever. It just, it just is what it is. Speaking of our viewers, I see we got a couple of people in the stream. If you're in the stream, can you give us a shout real quick so we can see who all is here and give us a little radio check, make sure that the microphones are sounding good and the levels are good. How's everybody doing out in the chat land? Yeah. And I feel bad because I, I saw a bunch of people have written me stuff on the <laughs> on the forum, which I'm not ignoring you guys. I literally just got back from vacation and well, Got back Friday night, but I've relaxed Saturday and Sunday <laughs> to relax from vacation. You know how it is. And so I'm going to check everything out tonight. All right. We got a good crowd in here tonight. Okay. AJC is here. Blake is here. Floyd is here. It's 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 one of those things where we got some real knowledgeable people in the chat. It's always nice to see uh, people who know, know a lot who can contribute to the conversation hanging out with us in the chat. So glad to know we're sounding good. So, Nick, what is the topic yeah. for tonight? I have no idea. Oh, good. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, we're just going to go over uh, speaker specs to a certain degree. We're just going to go over, uh, you know, how to pick out speakers, right? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you my goal. Um, I, I probably, it was probably been two years, but I made a video where I just pulled up some, um, Hey, there's get some good to see you here as well. Speedway audio three, Daniel Miller. Good to see everybody. I don't think I remember seeing Daniel Miller in the chat. Are you new Daniel? We're glad to have you. Um, no, I made a video been here for a while. Oh, cool. I made a video and in that video, I just showed some uh, subwoofer enclosures for sale on Amazon and kind of talked about the good and the bad of the various enclosures. And as a result, result of that, people commented on that video asking what about, and they would throw out a, 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 a brand of box. And my thought was, well, if you watch the video, I told you what to look for. So I yeah. shouldn't have to look up every box. People want recommendations though, because they want reassurance they're buying the right thing. And so my goal is to help people pick things out. And so maybe you're new at this, maybe you've been doing this for a long time, but when you're looking through the mountains and mountains of A, the marketing information and B, the technical specifications that come with <laughs> a speaker, what the hell should you be looking at, Nick? <laughs> what well, do all these I numbers mean? I actually just came to hear your discussion. I, I have no idea. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that can be very confusing on what you want, what you don't want. Modeling is important. A lot of things are important. And as Blake says, the skin effect is most important. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're going to be going over those types of things. Uh, and, and we're going to go over one of the ones that I think even just, I want to put it this way. Even just looking at specs and trying to compare them speaker to speaker can sometimes be an impossible task if you're unfamiliar with how different speaker manufacturers give those specs out. Let's put it that way. Right. right. You'll, you'll understand more as we go along. And uh, Brian Steele has hammered on one of the things we're definitely going to talk about that, and that is the physical measurements of the speaker. Mm -hmm. And by that, we mean, A, like how it measures if you were to put a measurement mic on it and put a DATS on it, and B, like how physically large or small the speaker is. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just to kind of talk about that, I, I'm going to go ahead and go into that a little. I built the Cinema 10s not too long ago. And... I built an entire box and <laughs> this is going to be funny. Some people are going to be like, how did you do this? It, this happens to the best of us. I built the entire box and the cinema tends to use a compression driver and, and a uh, wave guide or a horn, however you want to call it. And then of course they use a 10 inch driver. Now, typically when we're building a loudspeaker, the woofer is what we have to worry about as far as the distance to the back of the cabinet, right? Because the woofer usually sticks out much further than the back of a tweeter. That's not always the case when you use a waveguide. So the very first version of the Cinema 10, since they were going to be rear surrounds, I wanted them to be really, really flat. And I built it, designed it, dropped that tweeter, that compression driver in with the waveguide, and it stuck out by like a half an inch. I'm sorry, like a not a half an inch, like a quarter of an inch. And I was like, oh. 
you, so you I, mean I went be, and built a new box. It needs to be thin, right? And there's nothing okay. worse than building an enclosure, cutting holes, doing all the fabrication work, and physically putting the drive unit into the driver into the box and it not fitting. And I'm going to do a quick quick screen share. Here. And I mean, it was it was like barely like almost. I was like, man, I'm. If I really wanted to, I could make that thing work, <laughs> but I was just like, all right, new box it is. So uh, these are some speaker terminals. I picked these up. I ordered some stuff from NVX, uh, their website. Um, and if you ever want to buy from their website, I've got a coupon code, DIY Audio 10, should give you a little discount on those. Um, and you can see what I've done here is I, I cut a hole with my router to make sure that I had the right size for my speaker terminals. And every time I buy terminal cups, I buy more than one. <laughs> And then I grab a Sharpie, a silver Sharpie, and I write on the back the whole size. Oh, <laughs> because, because I have done that where I have cut a hole and dropped the speaker in, and the speaker fell through the damn hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I thought this was a six and a half, and thunk, off it goes, and it's just, you know, facepalm moment. So just how how big around the darn thing is actually matters. <laughs> And this is one of those things I want to I want to touch on this because this is one of those things where people say, oh, you have a uh, CNC. So therefore, it's much easier. I want you to know that CNC is not always easier because you use the manufacturer specs that they tell you on the driver sheet. There's tolerances there, plus or minus so many millimeters. And trust me, I've used their specs, cut it perfectly to size and it not fit in there. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And sometimes the manufacturer specs are just plain wrong, <laughs> like off completely, like not even close. So read James's comment. <laughs> James, been there, done that. Assume the Magna 12 passive radiators were the same inch diameter as the Magma 12s. Yep, not the case. Really sucks when you build the entire enclosure to learn this. We've all been there. We've all done it. It's, you know, if you've done this enough, you've done that because you make the assumption that one speaker is going to fit in one hole is going to fit in the next hole. It's going to fit. And it just doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, first of all, I don't care what it is. I grab the router. I make a test cut and I keep, I try to keep the piece so I don't have to go digging back for it. I can use it as a template for like routing it on the table. Everything I cut, every time I do a router cut for a driver, I write down what it, what it was in case I use that driver again. And I save the scrap piece. Um, it's because you, you never know, um, like the Ultimax 10 that I've got, I've made several boxes for that driver. It's oversized and it's bigger mm -hmm. than the spec sheet says. Uh, by at least a 16th of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch. And so if you cut the speaker cut out according to the specs, it doesn't fit. <laughs> and you can't route out another <laughs> with the circle jig again after you've routed out the hole the first time. Well, the, the best way to do that, by the way, if, if you do that and you need to route that out, what you do is you cut a bigger hole in, an, in a sacrificial piece of material. Use some double-sided tape if you can or tape with some CA glue is really good and put it over your existing hole and just try to line it up as perfect as you can and then use a template bit. And then that, that will allow you to enlarge it. I, I've made enough mistakes to do that. What of you know, making it larger is easier than making it smaller. And when I need to make the hole oh, yeah. larger, sometimes I'll just grab uh, my rabbiting bit and set it up for a one sixteenth inch mm -hmm. rabbit and then hit it with a flush trim bit. And that usually gets the job done. Yeah, I actually did a whole video on how to do that <laughs> oh. on that rabbit bit. Yeah, gotcha, <laughs> a long gotcha. time ago. But, you know, I, that that is the true. And I like what Brian Steele says. He said, that's why the baffle is the last part that I stick to the speaker box. And I think that's a good point to like if we're just going to throw up like, hey, here's what you should do. Glue the whole box together. Open up a can of pop. Pr preferably Michael Buble pop. <laughs> and then... And then put put your baffle on, but don't glue it on and test to make sure the speaker fits and that you're not hitting anything inside, whether that be a brace or the back of the box or something. It's much easier to fix an issue with the box before you glue the front baffle on. I'm uh, working on a project now. I've got it finished. Um, it is a, a thin box that's wedge shaped. I've never done a, a wedge shaped box or a thin box because I've just never had to. I've always been able to do something different. And, um, and the extra steps you got to go through to make sure it fits, um, it's, it's time consuming. 
And there's yeah. a whole lot of trial and error and let's see if this fits and, oh, that didn't, let's try it again. And part of it is if you're trying to build a really thin box to go like behind the seat of an extended cab truck or something like that, you really got to worry about the clearance. Yeah. And always, you know, the biggest thing that we're saying right now is always test it. Like if you're going to, my last build was the uh, Epic Hi-Fi build, which a lot of you guys watch. And I, I appreciate that. It's, it's been getting a lot of traction. So it, I, I really appreciate you guys watching that. Put a lot of time and effort into that build. It's a walnut baffle. That front baffle was not cheap. So you better believe that I tested numerous times on the CNC before that. And I want to throw this out there too. This is something a lot of people don't think about. You have to use, at least leave some clearance if you're going to paint it or finish it in any way, shape or form. Because if you don't and you paint that sucker and your paint's pretty thick, guess what? Your speaker's not fitting in there anymore either. What's the Panther by my? I'm not familiar with the Panther by Myers. I'll have to look into that one. So I've got uh, I got some props, Nick. Um, I always bring my props, and so several <laughs> things here. And I've got most of these linked in the video description, not all of them. And the first oh, thing that cool. I want to show you is uh, I've shown these on this on the show before. These are some Polk Audio uh, six and a half inch uh, coaxial speakers. I bought two sets of these when I bought these. I'm still running a set as the rear fill in my truck. I like them. They've got a crossover on the back of them, so they're a good, solid speaker. Oh, hey, well, Joaquin Juarez has given us a nice. super chat. So, or for you, it might be buble money. There you go. Right. So we thank you so much for the super <laughs> chats. Um, it means a lot to us when y'all can y'all can reach into your pocket and give us those. Uh, it kind of helps keep us motivated. <laughs> um, it does. Hey, so, when you get done with that, uh, 25 Hertz to Life has a funny story. Go right ahead. Uh, no. Do you use, you use polyfilm? <laughs> In some, yes. <laughs> I do use polyfilm in a lot of my boxes or or something to that extent. It's That's just a... We can, we can talk we, about that later. We could do a whole... But, next week's show might be polyfilm. <laughs> poly <laughs> to to um, do or not to do? <laughs> it, it's... It's a great speaker. I, I like it. I like the look. It, I think it is a paper cone. It's just been painted. And this is the adapter that Crutchfield sent with it when I ordered it. It's a Scotch adapter. It's a six by nine to five and a, or six and a half inch adapter. And it just fits perfect. There's a little bit of slop, um, but it fits just fine. And it's filthy. It's been out in the garage. I actually did use these. You can see gasket on it there. It's great, right? If it's perfect, six and a half inch. Well, okay. Here is. <laughs> um, this is a six and a half inch NVX from their X series. And um, so same, same manufacturer. Uh, no, no, well, this same is company. NVX, and the other one was Polk audio. Oh, I thought the so other one was on. So, so NVX is, um, is, you know, they're doing some videos with me right now and sending me some stuff. Nice carbon fiber cone. It's real carbon fiber. Let's put that in there. Um, huh, nope. <laughs> But they're both six and a halves, right? Cool. So how can they both be six and a halves and they not fit on the six and a half inch to six by nine adapter, Nick? Um, magic. Magic. All right. Illusion. Here's I went and saw six and a half. This is the, the polycone six and a half from Parts Express, the little $8 polycone. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes a great prop because it's so cheap. And this is one that I'm going to put in the DIY audio teenagers car that I keep threatening to do, but never seem to have time. That's a Hertz uh, six and a half, really thin little speaker. I don't much care for the way the frame looks, but it's going to be behind a grill. How does it do? Nope. <laughs> not so do not you, which is interesting because I bet you, if you measured that Polk audio, it's really like closer to six and a quarter on the outside or six. So I think that the Hertz is supposed to be a six and three quarter. And I think that the, um, the MVX is as well. And the Polk actually, apparently, uh, the back doors of my truck are supposed to be five and a quarters and the Polk drops in, just fits in perfect without an adapter. Yeah. I, yeah. I, that Polk doesn't seem like six and a half because typically, which, which is interesting. You measure the outside diameter of, everything and mm -hmm. that's what what gets you to six and a half now it's interesting because when you look at pa drivers they don't measure the same way they actually measure the actual driver so like a six inch 
like PA driver is basically like a six and a half inch, like what you're looking at. The cone is six inches. Uh, yeah, from uh, well, surround to surround. Surround to surround. So this is um, the um, this is the same driver that's in the Tritrix kit from Parts Express. It's a five and a quarter. And it is almost as big as the Polk. And if you look at cone area to cone area, it's about yeah. the same. And it's a lot beefier and a lot thicker. And so the, the Polk is really kind of like a, maybe it's a six inch driver. Right? Yeah. And, and I think Brian has it right. The important spec is the mounting diameter. And when we talk about the mounting diameter, we pick that back up. Or Which here, I can, it doesn't matter. Or you got one? I can show you this, got one. Well, this is a passive radiator. It doesn't matter. This Still is really saying, dirty yeah. passive radiator. This is the outside diameter, right? Yeah. And then the mounting diameter would be back here, like where you see this round part, right? That would be the cutout size. So like Parts Express, I think, calls it the cutout size. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. people will call it the mounting diameter. There's different names for this, but it would be this area here. You need to make sure that part is a part that you can fit. Because if you can't fit it, you're going to have to be trimming something or creating an adapter or something. So there are three numbers. There's the speaker cutout. There's the bolt diameter. And then there's the outside diameter. And yeah, you diameter. really need to know all three, especially if you're going to, say, cut a recess or something. And the the five and a quarter, you know, the, 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 the Tritrix kit uh, recommends to recess the speaker. And you can just do that with a rabbiting bit. And they'll just, you know, the, the directions are really clear on that. And that's really nice. And, and when we say the bolt, the bolt diameter is usually more of an issue with car audio than it is home audio. Bolt diameter, you really don't necessarily need to know unless it's a replacement driver. And even then, you don't need to. But wh wh while we're talking about this, someone had a really good statement earlier. Oh. I think it was Speedway Audio. He said, hey, bedliner can cause leaks because of its texture. I wanted to hit that while you're talking about mounting. So if I use Bedliner or I use Exo Hide or anything like that on the outside part of it, anywhere I'm mounting the speaker, that does not touch. I use like if I'm using black, for example, I use a black spray paint can to, to spray paint all around there. And then I paint that black Bedliner on the rest of the enclosure, but not where the driver is actually going. And I, I think that's a very good thing for most people to do. And if you're worried about it, you can always uh, put a gasket. Not every speaker has a good gasket. The cheap $8 one has no gasket at all. Uh, this expensive Hertz, no gasket. It may, it may be a gasket in the box somewhere. Um, the NVX has um, a, a no gasket. So you really, need, you really need to put a gasket on these things. Um, well, you can also put a gasket directly on the cabinet itself if you want right. to. You know, the, right at the bottom, the bigger one. The Polk did come with a gasket, but it fell off. So um, it wasn't stuck on. It was just a loose one that you, that you put on there. Nice. Gaskets can solve a lot of problems. But in general, I would rather not have to worry about that. So I'd rather just leave that. I mean, I always have a gasket on there, but you know what I'm saying. Hey, Nick, here's the box from the Hertz. And the um, mount, the outside diameter, according to the box, is 165 millimeters. They're saying that's six and a half inches. And they're saying the uh, cutout is five and a half inches. So they're saying this thing has an outside diameter of six and a half inches. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it seems to be a little bit. Maybe that's close. It is. It's 6.4, 165 millimeters, 6.49606. You just know that off the top so, of your head. Yeah, I, I Google searched it. Oh, okay. <laughs> like I, when you said 165 millimeters, I'm like, I don't know what that is. Let me look. But but you need to be looking at those three things. And the bolt circle diameter gets to be really important. Uh, sometimes if you've got like a, a, a subwoofer um, and you've cut the hole slightly too big, it'll be yeah. fine as long as the bolt circle diameter is sufficiently big enough. Um, the problem is that if you cut it a little bit too big and you've got a small bolt circle diameter and now the bolts miss the, miss the baffle when you screw it in, the screws miss the baffle when you bolt it in. And that, that really is an issue, especially if you're building like a really heavy subwoofer or something and you're using, um, T nuts or something to, mm -hmm. to hold it in to be very problematic. And that's the thing about T nuts. You really only need T nuts if you've got, 
a pretty beefy subwoofer and you can only really get away using T-nuts if you've got enough of a, the flange has to be big enough so you're not having the T-nut interfere with the basket. That's true. That's a good point. First time I tried T-nuts, that's what happened. And now I don't use them. I hate them. It's just too much trouble. <clears throat> wood ans- uh, AJC also said wood inserts for the win. Yep. I've used those. Well, Joaquin Juarez is looking for a recommendation in the chat for a good four inch coaxial oh, or component. It- and by the way, Joaquin, basically because of the super chat, man, you can ask whatever questions you want. We're probably going to answer them, assuming <laughs> that they're on on target. I mean, if you ask where his hair went, that may not happen. You could actually ask me that too. That's why I always wear a hat. <laughs> I just embrace it, man. I've been bald for a long time. <laughs> you know what? Four, four inch, uh, four inch are nice, and I'll tell you why four inch are good. Four inch are good because you can use these on ammo cans. A lot of people like to do those like Bluetooth ammo can builds. And four mm-hmm. inch is the perfect size for them. You use a typically you'll use a three and a half inch uh, hole saw to cut out the hole for it to stick in. And uh, you can use, I mean, I cannot think of what size it is, but you can actually get fan grills and they usually mount up with the mounting holes on the four inch. Most of the four inches, I would say, um, you know what? France isn't that far away if you live in Paris. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, so I've used a couple four inches because of that. And the JBL GTO series was always a good one that I, I enjoyed for me. Um, that, that would be some that I used. Now they weren't, they were coaxial. They were not component sets. Right. Do you have any just most ammo can builds tend to go with the coaxial from what I, what I've seen. Yeah. And honestly, the only four inch drivers I've used are because of ammo can style builds. So, I, I, I didn't use them in a vehicle. So take that for what it's worth. All right. I'm out of props. But I can find some more. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> All right. I, I, I like I like my props. So let me do this. Let me um, let me add. Uh, let's share a picture. So I mentioned earlier oh, that also the, also I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one more out. the Polk Audio were also pretty decent ones the uh, that DB series right I forget what these are the sticker came off the back so I have no idea what series they were um, here's another example uh, so these are um, this is a box that I built for the I built it for the speaker on the right that's the MX10 from uh, Parts Express. And on the left is the uh, thin NVX subwoofer that I'm, that I'm working on. And just for kicks and giggles, I thought I'd see if the NVX driver would fit into this other box. And it fits perfectly because it's using a standard size frame. Now, it's using yeah. a shallow frame. The shallow one is, of course, because it is a shallow mount subwoofer. Um, but there are some standard size frames and not every subwoofer is going to use a standard size frame. And the issue here is that if I were to drop, um, uh, you know, the even the like the RSS HO, the high output uh, aluminum cone subwoofer into it, that one uses a slightly oversized frame. The uh, parts, the uh, Dayton Audio, excuse me, the Ultimax wouldn't fit in here because of the oversized frame. But th- these two fit, you know, interchangeably just fine because they're using that same size frame. They even got close to the same outside diameter. So you've got these different frame sizes uh, you have to deal with. And they're all 10 inch subwoofers, but they all have a different frame. So there you go. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a great point uh, in general, just pay attention to the frame size, you know, is it, and this, this is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of companies that like Apple, you know, which obviously we wouldn't be using anything Apple for anything we're talking about today, but that do a lot of proprietary stuff that makes it hard for you to interchange things. And you, didn't right. you, I was going to ask you, didn't you use these in your boombox build? That's right. It was in the boombox build. Yep. Yeah. What did you think of those? I thought the crossover needed to, in order to get them to sound good was too damn complicated for it to be worthwhile. Yeah. I mean, I, I could, I feel like there was probably 8,000 components in that crossover. Uh, so, and it, you know, it came with the kit, right. And it was just a real pain in the rear end to get the crossover to fit on a board that would fit inside that tiny boom box. Mm. Uh, but that's my biggest issue with them is you need to do a lot of crossover work with it. Hey, and I would feel like for a car, it's probably not 
not necessarily worth it because uh, that's my opinion. Um, because you're probably going to be using mostly digital anyway, mm. like with DSP or something of that nature, I, unless, unless you just want to bypass, you know, any physical components, I guess that would make sense. I mean, if I were going to use that uh, four inch uh, Dayton audio coincident driver, I would use one of the DSP amps with it simply because the crossover is such a pain. Uh, but, and again, in a car, I'd do the same thing. I wouldn't try to wire up a, a, a passive crossover with that. It's just, I think it may have been six components on that crossover. Yeah, I can understand. Jesse, I think power base, don't they have a line of just drop in replacement speakers that they're making? Is that part of their drop in replacement speakers? Anybody know? I know one of those companies has started making drop in replacements that are just made to, to replace factory speakers. I'm not sure if that was them. So, um, someone had mentioned, uh, the cue of the driver. Um, I'm just, I'll throw out, uh, a link there. If you want to go there, I don't know that we're going to get to it today, but there's yeah. a link to my website where I talked a lot about the cue of the wet, the driver. I know we, we spent an almost an entire episode when we talked about, um, speaker, uh, was it subwoofers, subwoofer tuning maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the Q, I mean, we can, we can briefly review the Q and that's more your area of expertise and we can use that to dive into discussing TS parameters in general. So tell me like the big question is always what Q do I need if I want to use a speaker in a door, if I want to put a mid range in a door, what's the, what should the Q be? Well, typically over one. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can look at this. Uh, there's the efficiency bandwidth product, the EBP, which is what Vance Dickinson talks about in his loudspeaker uh, cookbook. And that's uh, FS divided by QES. And then you'll get a number from anywhere between one to a hundred. If the number's closer to 50, the better it is for a sealed box closer to a hundred, the better for a ported box. The Q of a driver, if it's the QTS is typically the number is 0.4 or below. It's typically best suited for a ported enclosure. So you want something 0.4 or below. 0.4 to 0.7 is typically best for sealed. And then anything above 0.7 is typically good for free air infinite baffle, although most people look for something above one. However, there is a lot more to it. Those are all rules of thumb. So there are plenty of drivers like the Dayton Ultimax who completely smashed that out of the water and the queue doesn't match up for what most people are using it for, even though it does really good free air, really good and sealed or ported boxes. So, you know, that's rule of thumb. And I think that's kind of a good jumping off place for looking at TS parameters. Um, and I think that the mistake people make is they say, Hey, what TS parameters should I be looking for? If I want to do, you know, blank, fill in the blank, you know, what should my resonant frequency be? For example, if and I want to take off my neighbors. Right, right. That's <laughs> always the question. Right? I want to make my neighbors mad. What do I need to get? What TS parameters should I be looking for? And what's, why, what's that? You were going to. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. And, and while it's true that a driver with a lower FS will have an easier time hitting low notes, you don't have to have a driver with a low FS to reproduce bass and, and do a good job at it. Because no, actually. Other factors, Go right? Go ahead. No, you're right. And I think a lot of people think FS, which is all it stands for is uh, free air resonant. Like what's the resonant frequency in free air? A lot of people assume that the resonant frequency of free air, it, it can't be tuned below that or that's its tuning frequency. Those are the two most common misconceptions with FS. Uh, Jeff Bagby said it the best at one point in time um, when he said, hey, FS really in itself doesn't mean anything. Some drivers are going to tune below FS. Some drivers are going to tune above FS. Some are going to tune at FS. You just, you, you need them all to get that. And, and I think that's really important to uh, think about and why I think programs that are free, like WinISD are so important for people because you can easily um, identify uh, what your speaker is going to actually tune to with a program like that. And that's the thing. There isn't some simple, easy shortcut you can get from just looking at TS parameters to know what 
tuning frequency you should be using. Uh, if you want to use the TS parameters, it really there, you know, I don't know the math behind what goes on in WinISD. If I knew the math that was going on in WinISD, I'd make my own program because WinISD is such a pain in the rear. Um, but you throw the numbers into something like WinISD or Basebox Pro or uh, some online calculator because the math is a little too hard for someone to do on the back of an envelope. Uh, so if you want to see what their frequency response is, there's no way to do that without using software. Or power handling. Right. Based off right. the box you've built, which I'm sure we're going to get to at some point in time in this show. Uh, actually, I, I don't remember if that was on topic or not. Uh, I might be know, off topic. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, I had, I had an outline that I sent Nick ahead of time just so we can make sure that if we ever like hit a point where we didn't anything to talk about, we could grab the outline, but we've never had a problem. Hey, Stu's got a really good point down here. So uh, Stu, by the way, uh, Stu gives me some good advice. Uh, he'll send me pictures of stuff he's working on and he is, he's, he's skilled. Um, and, uh, I'll send him pictures of what I'm working on. He'll say, here's what you should do. And it's like, yeah, but I can't do that because I'm not as good as you. So, uh, he's got, he's got some good looking stuff he's put out. Um, so a lot of parameters will shift as the woofer loosens up or as the air changes. So Nick, you've done that. You've broken in a subwoofer on your channel. What happens to TS parameters when you break in the subwoofer? Well, they, they, they can change and they can actually make a complete difference when you're designing them. However, hopefully most reputable brands that give you those will give you the specs that are broken in there. There's another issue that you have with a lot of subwoofers. At, well, a lot of speakers in general, I should say a lot of speakers. Um, there's a reason why speakers like the Dayton Epic are coming out or in a lot of reasons why like the CSS SDX 12, or the Tang Band W8 were expensive drivers. People would look at them and say, well, they're relatively expensive compared to another eight inch driver, compared to another 12 inch driver, whatever. I mean, the five and a half inch Epic is a hundred dollars, but all of those use uh, a type of motor that tries to keep linearity the same with power. Um, so what that means is if you take a look at uh, the XBL2 motor is a split gap motor. Uh, it's an underhung motor. Uh, that's what CSS uses. That's what Tang Band, uh, I believe, used a version of that. There's just an underhung. I'm not sure if they use the XBL2. Adir Audio, which is just now at Parts Express, uses the XBL2 motor. Uh, and Parts Express, the new one, uses a multiple magnet. And the basic premise, and someone else can probably clarify this a little bit better than I can, the basic premise is you have a voice coil that stays within a magnetic field. But when you have just one magnet down here, it can go out of that magnetic field. And when it does, right, then the TS parameters are going to change. So by creating a split gap motor with, with the magnets, it stays in that magnetic field longer, give you more excursion, and those TS parameters will stay the same with a little bit of power or a lot of power. Same with um, the new multiple, the MMAG motors. So they have that one magnet, and then they have all the little magnets all around it. And that allows you to stay within that magnetic gap longer. And it's one of the reasons that I believe that five and a half inch driver is capable of 14 millimeters of X-Max, which is just insane. I, that's, if I remember correctly, that's more X-Max than their 12 inch high output subwoofer, Dayton Audios. It's just crazy when you think about it. That's, so uh... the, the, the basic premise though is if you, if you clipple tested a lot of these drivers, some of the drivers are going to respond differently depending on the amount of power. Now, how much differently? That's a whole nother story. <laughs> some are going to some are going to swing pretty wide and some are, are, are not going to make that much of a difference at all. So th these two drivers right here, I think, are a good example of, of that whole X-Max conversation. So I forget what the um, there's two ways, more than one way to calculate X-Max. Um, typically it's calculated based on the length of the coil relative to the gap. And I don't know the exact formula, but it's, it's a measurement you take and you calculate to get the X max. So the MX 10 over here, when measured with a clipple has a whole lot more X max, it stays linear well outside of that range. And it's got a lot of X max real you know, 18 or something like that. Huge number. This little shallow sub right here though, because it's such a compact little voice coil only has eight millimeters of X max. And even though this subwoofer is supposed to be a 350 watt subwoofer, 
I wouldn't want to give it 350 watts. Whereas that MX driver over there, which is, I think, a 400 watt subwoofer, I'd be comfortable throwing 500 at it because uh, it's not going to distort because it can drive further. You know, it'll handle more power in that regard. But power handling isn't just about that. What else is power handling? Oh, are you talking to me? Yes. I, I don't know. I, I was reading a comment. What did you oh. say? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was reading Stu's comment and I didn't get a chance to finish it. Um, so what, what did you ask now? I'm talking about, um, so you, you said 300 Watts isn't always true. You don't want to give it 300 Watts. I heard that right, part and then I, right, then because, I zoned out. Simply because, and so the thing about the X max, you don't want to go oh, beyond right. X max because if you go gotcha. beyond X max, you're nonlinear. It'll start to sound distorted. You can push beyond that. Right. So what, what's beyond X max then, Nick? Well, you can go beyond X. I don't, I don't know if there's a technical term. I, I don't know if anyone calls it, but you'll, you'll go b beyond excursion and eventually damage your subwoofer. And one of the things that, you know, both Justin and I have a, it's hard to explain to a lot of people that don't design their own stuff in win ISD is that when you hear that power rating, it's usually, yeah, x -Mech, yeah. Um, when you talk about that power rating, what we're talking about is a thermal number. So we're talking about what it can actually handle thermally. What, we're, what they're not talking about is what it can handle inside the box that you put it in, which is actually a different story. If you put it in one enclosure versus another enclosure, that rms number that max wattage that's all going to change right so james here has a question uh don't companies use different measurement points for x max as well they're not supposed to it's supposed to be a standardized thing so it's supposed yeah. to be one-way travel um and so if it has um 22 millimeters of x max it should be able to go out 22 millimeters and then move in 22 millimeters for a total throw of 44 millimeters and if i don't move my hand back and forth you miss the point right um <laughs> but there are companies that will give you the peak to peak and call that the x max yeah uh, you know and and the truth of the matter is unfortunately there's really no one keeping companies as far as I know, really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Accountable. Mm -hmm. So, and unfortunately in audio, a lot of these things, we, we are going to recommend you really model, assuming that you can trust the numbers they give you because without modeling it, you're, you're going to be very confused very fast. And this is one of the reasons why I don't tell people to pay attention to the RMS number, don't pay attention to the maximum wattage number, ignore those things, model it in WinISD and see what the wattage versus the SPL that you're going to get out of it and see what that actually equates to. Because believe it or not, a lot of times you'll be surprised at the difference in SPL between 200 watts and 400 watts. It's not much, mm -hmm. guys. No. Now, no, if you're no. in competition, it might be. What are your thoughts on Jesse's comment right there? Will I grab a prop? Crossover frequency will also change the power handling. No, that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, crossover frequency of a subwoofer, of a mid-range, of a tweeter. Um, I just finished recording a video for the Epic. People wanted me to go in more technical details of the Epic driver. And, you know, just doing like a third order on a tweeter, for example, will allow you to get a lot better power handling on that tweeter versus if you were to do a second order and and should depending on where your distortion is in that driver also cut down on distortion so this is the tweeter and hey i love i love oh. how smart all our guys are because they're like throwing out the numbers out there right so i said hey you'd be surprised at the 204 i actually did a video on this and and look everyone's like throwing out the number it's three decibels it's three decibels it's three de and they're right it, it's not it's not a significant amount you'd be surprised um, and that's why I always tell people, hey, model it out. You're, you're going to be surprised at the difference. It's not as much as you think. I think the power number in general gets very skewed by a lot of people. 
and you know, at what frequency, right? I mean, there's just, you know, what power at what frequency there's a lot that goes into as far as the tweeter, uh, as far as the tweeter power handling goes. So this is a little tiny tweeter That's that came point. with this Hertz six and a half. This is from the component set. And on the back of the tweeter, it says 80 Hertz, excuse me, 80 Watts. Oh, I was like, back what? Of this, <laughs> sorry, 80 Watts. Sorry. And the back of the woofer says a hundred Watts and okay. How can this little tiny tweeter handle a hundred Watts when this six and a half inch woofer can handle a hundred? What's going on there? Well, here's what's going on. Uh, the power handling for a tweeter means absolutely nothing because tweeters actually don't move that much. They don't, there's not much information up there at those really high frequencies and the cone doesn't move a lot. And even if you were to hook it up to an amplifier and cross it over appropriately and hook it up to an 80 watt per channel amp, it would probably never see 80 Watts. And if it did, it would blow <laughs> because there's no way that little thing can handle 80 watts. But it put it on 80 watt per channel amp, it'll, you'll never get 80 watts to it. No, you won't. And I mean, that's kind of the point of it. it and I always wonder when manufacturers say that. Yeah, I get a lot of people that will say to me, I don't understand why tweeters are, are rated so low. They're only rated at 15 or 20 watts. I need one that at least has 100 watts rated output and, and they're significantly more expensive. And I'm like, what are you? putting these in oh just some tower speakers and where do they cross that i don't know five thousand hertz you don't get the 15 watt one you're fine <laughs> you know like i mean it's it's just but that's the thing we a lot of times those are those are numbers that we can look at and we think oh man we really need a big number because if our speaker needs 100 watts therefore all of the drivers need 100 watts and that's just not the case your tweeter is going to handle significantly less wattage than something like your woofer will and the amount of power it will handle will be a function of the crossover so if you have it exactly if you've got it crossed over at 5000 hertz it'll never see hardly much power at all and you can just put a big amp on it you'll be fine uh blake asked a question i feel like blake kind of tossed us a, a little bit of a softball here um uh, when you get past x max you lose the ability to handle thermal power uh only if you're clipping, because then your woofer is pushed out and you've got heat going through it with no cooling going on. But I think Blake probably probably knows more about this than, than most people do. So he's a bit of an expert on this. And uh, let me say some hi to some people here. I saw David K pop up. Hey, David K. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah. What's up, David K? Oh, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, uh, saw Sean Mullen pop up. Uh, I think I put him on the screen for a second. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Uh, and and RGA? RGA oh, contacted yep. RGA contacted me via Facebook. He wanted to uh, talk to me about my latest build on the uh, the um, Epic Hi-Fi build, and we never got to talk. So I'm still waiting for that. If you if you ever want to talk, he he contacted me while I was on vacation. I'm like I'm on vacation. I was gonna make time for him though. He told I told him I hey man I'll make some time for you. Just let me know. But he didn't want to break up my vacation. I appreciate that. So here's a question for you, Nick. What's up with the light bulb in series with the tweeter? What? I don't know. I don't know anything about that. I think it's used as a fuse. Well, I, that I could see. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen that. <laughs> I feel like I've seen that before uh, using a light bulb as a fuse. So, uh, but but the power handling thing is just kind of it's not straightforward, right? The, the numbers on the side right. of the box are a marketing term. And yeah, you know, we're not talking about comparing one of those big subwoofers that like Digital Designs makes versus some small subwoofer from Boss. I'm talking about comparing the power handling on a pair of six and a halves. Um, the power handling on these two things aren't going to be that much different. And what they'll actually see in the real world is not going to be that much different. And that's not to run down the more expensive driver. Um, it's just, eh, it's not what people think it is. It's not really, it's just a number that's marketing. Interesting. And, and and you're right. I was reading people's comments saying, yeah, yeah it's like yeah. a fuse and oh, no, a true voice of reason also said it limits current. It's pretty interesting. Okay. So it like burns up some power. That makes sense. Cause it takes power to make a light bulb turn on. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, like I said, I, I've never done that. Um, I don't foresee myself doing that. But interesting. I, I have seen uh, pro audio speakers with fuses inside the crossover. Um, 
<laughs> and I and I've actually there was one there was someone we were throwing away at work and I cracked them open because I want to see what was inside and the fuses were on jumpers so that you could actually uh, attenuate the tweeter by um, by switching out the fuse location. Um, so Matthew Carpenter said, "Yeah, you." Uh, Matthew Carpenter did say you should try to calculate X max ahead of time, you know, so that you do get an accurate model. And that's that's a good point if you can. And obviously. Uh, one of the better ways to do that is to run the subwoofer with a a ruler, and you can you can do it that way if you want to. It's not simple to do. I mean, some people might have more. I, I never do that. Most of the time, if you buy from a reputable company, you don't have to worry about that um, as much. But that's I guess that's one of the problems of buying from an unreputable company. I don't know. Every, every company, you know, is going to put power numbers but, on the box and, you but know. he's absolutely, I, I agree with him though. It's absolutely right. I mean, if you can measure these things, measure them, you know, I, right. I'm all for measuring everything you can, can measure. Yep. And that's, you know, I, I really have enjoyed playing around with my uh, um, SMD AMM1 because it's allowed mm. me to measure the actual power coming from an amplifier. And like when I'm modeling WinISD, I always assume 80% of the amplifier's rated power because guess what? Very rarely and just driving around on regular music do you get more than 80% of the power. Now, it's different if you're trying to, you know, do an SPL contest or something, but you just don't really see 80%, uh, more than 80% power very often. And, and you know what happens at those SP, SPL contests all the time? They're rebuilding their subwoofers. <laughs> yep. Smoke yeah, them and I take mean, them out, put them back in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what happens when you, you push them that that hard and that, you know, that long, especially if you're giving them more wattage than they're really designed. Of course, you know, in, in SPL, that's it's not really what you care about. You care about just that one, that one note, <laughs> you know. And it's like it's like a car designed for drag racing, right? A drag racer, you can't do anything with it, but go straight down a track extremely fast. And it's kind of stupid and pointless, but super cool anyways. So <laughs> what's the, you know, what's the, you know, people like to complain about the loud radios, but think car, fast cars are cool. What's the difference? It's the same concept. Hey, I like I like what James said. It's a good question. He said, "What about the other way? Down for sound seems to mark an amp at twenty three hundred watts, but benchmarks at four thousand. Should users be that? scared of that?" James, yeah. So here, That's what are your true. thoughts on that, Nick? I have an unpopular opinion, but I want to know your thought first. I, I have an unpopular opinion too. I, I think it is absolutely scary. I yeah, I don't I, want that. I, I'm I don't idiot. want that for a lot of reasons. Go ahead. I'm of the I'm of the opinion that if you put a label on your amplifier, whatever number you put on it, and you send it out to the big D whiz and he puts it on his amp dyno, it should be plus or minus five, ten percent tops uh, of, yeah. of the rated power. Because that's no within, problem with, that's within I have, tolerance. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say I know I'm sorry. I thought you were done. I was gonna say I have no problem with ten percent because most components are plus or minus ten percent. Right, right. And what what happens is is simply it's a real simple thing. It, it's marketing, just a marketing trick, right? So if I buy a truckload of amplifiers from China and they're thousand watt amplifier boards that legit put out thousand watts plus or minus five or ten percent, and I stamp fifteen hundred on the side and I call it the DIY fifteen hundred, and it dynos for you know eleven hundred, well then I'm the jerk who's giving you less power than you paid for. But you could take the same amp. And you could stamp 800 on the side and you could get a dud that dinos for 900. And all of a sudden you're the good guy who's, who's giving people more power than they pay for. And you can charge a hundred bucks more for the amp than I can. Here's the deal. You should buy an amplifier that works for your speakers rated for your speakers. If you're buying one that you think your speakers should get no more than really 2,300 Watts RMS or peak or whatever you're trying to market it towards, and it benchmarks at 4,000 and you don't know this very easy. You could blow yourselves on it. Um, especially if you don't have any type of limiter or anything on that. So in my opinion, I would much rather have uh, an amplifier that says it even just for that alone. I don't want to be hooked up to an amplifier that, I mean, that's almost double. That's a, that's a huge difference. So I don't mind if it does 2,500 or whatever. And I think Brian's got a good point right there. Um, we we always forget about 
you know, you, if you're in a car, right. you need the, you need the alternator that can keep up with it. And, you know, you get the same problem in the house, only you've got 120 volts, 110 volts. So it's not, <laughs> not that big a deal, but you know, the, 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 the juice going in will limit the juice coming out. Huh. I like what Speedway audio says. If boss told the truth, no one would hate them. I don't know that that's true, but they definitely would hate them less. <laughs> I, I think he's exactly right. Um, uh, the boss amp that I tested price per watt, it's competitive with like an entry level Alpine. And why in the world would you, you know, pay Alpine money for a boss amp? But then again, if boss would just tell the truth, why would you hate them? Yeah. I mean, they're typically just not very good either way, but that's, I guess that's true too. You know, it is what it is. So there's one thing that I really did want to talk about too. So one of the specs, I, and I told Justin I really wanted to hit it if we can, and we got a little bit of time, so hit I want it. to throw this out there. One of the specs that uh, other people get confused on besides power is sensitivity. And I wanted to talk about that just because I think a lot of people look for that number and it gets a little bit confusing. Sensitivity, when you look at that number, it's going to be rated differently depending on what you're looking at. So for example, it might be rated at 2.83 volts at one meter, or it might be rated at one watt per one meter. Now, why is that so important? Well, 2.83 volts at eight ohm is typically what we would consider one watt. Okay. But when you drop it down to a four ohm, 2.83 volts is actually now two watts. So your sensitivity number is going to go up by about three decibels, which if you're looking at a four ohm speaker compared to an eight ohm speaker, and so if you're looking at two four ohm speakers and one's rating it at one watt per one meter and one's rating at 2.83 volts per one meter and one says, and the 2.83 volts says 86 and the one watt one says 83, well, guess what? It's the same sensitivity, but one looks better because it says 2.83 volts versus the one watt. So and let me, let me summarize the one watt at one meter, which is 2.83 volts at one meter, only works at eight ohms. So 2.83 volts and one watt at one meter is typically the equivalent of one watt. So 2.83 volts at eight ohms is typically equivalent to one watt. 2.83 volts at eight ohms is one watt. And 2.83 volts at four ohms should be two watts. So if they're giving you a sensitivity at, at yeah. 2.83 volts, you just go ahead and need to subtract 3 dB from it because they're lying to you. Well, not necessarily. I mean, Brian, you know, and a lot of people feel this way. Sensitivity should not, should be rated at 2.83 volts. It's fine. Everyone knows what 2.83 volts is. And there is, I, I kind of like the idea of 2.83 volts because you know, when you're throwing at 2.83 volts, everything is the same, right? Or whatever. But my whole point is, when you're looking at that sensitivity, you need to pay attention to whether it says 2.83 volts or one watt. Because if you're looking at a speaker that someone else said earlier, that it might say 2.83 volts at one ohm. Oh man, they just added a whole bunch of uh, sensitivity to, to that to that subwoofer, right? So um, now whether or not you, you agree with that assessment on how you should measure it is up to you. But if one of them's reading it at 2.83 volts at one ohm and the other one is also a dual two ohm voice coil subwoofer, but they're rating it at one watt per one meter at four ohm, you need to do the conversion to make sure that that subwoofer is actually more sensitive. Most of the time you find the very insensitive subwoofers to, to exaggerate that number or use the 2.83 volt at their lowest impedance. I should put it that way. So Agent Slugger said, it sounds like I'm in school from the 90s. And that is, you know, I, I look back at, at taking classes where I learned some of this math and I didn't understand it at the time. And I didn't understand why I needed to know it. And I'm always a big believer that if you want to understand something, you need an application for it to motivate you to understand it. That way you're not just looking at how many screwdriver turns <laughs> on <laughs> and, the and game. And this is what I, I like what Blake says, because I, I agree with this. Um, 
Blake said 2.83 volts is more useful when looking at crossovers and one watt is more useful when comparing individual speakers and subs. And I agree with that. When I'm, when I'm comparing them, I just want to compare apples to oranges and I would much rather everyone just say one watt, one meter. I know it. And if you want to throw your 2.83 volt at whatever impedance you want, give me that too. But I, I'd rather, and most, and I will say this, most PA drivers will give you both. I got pulled over for not following Ohm's law once. <laughs> All right. So uh, just, just so you know, Deviant has now won the comment of the night. And so someone <laughs> has got to say something funnier or drop a super chat or else Deviant's uh, comment is staying up <laughs> for the rest of the night. <laughs> for, the, for the last five. That was actually a good one. <laughs> I'm going to have to post that as a status update on Facebook or something. So, <laughs> oh, oh, did you resist arrest? <laughs> okay. That was actually good too. Joaquin Juarez wins it now. <laughs> awesome. What a great, what a great group of guys in the chat. And like I said before, so much knowledge in the chat, a lot of experienced people who know as much as Nick and I do. Um, uh, I don't pretend to know a lot. I'm just a hobbyist. I'm a DIYer and that's fun for me. So, um, so sensitivity, Nick, what else on your list did you want to talk about? I know I had a list. Let me look at my list. That, that was really the last thing I really wanted to talk about. And the, the biggest thing is I just want you to just be aware to look at the sensitivity number. Is it rating at 2.83 volts or is it? Oh, there you go. Did he get taste? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the super chat, Mike. <laughs> I just so, want people to be aware because I know a lot of people do look at that sensitivity number and I have to, I have to kind of go over that with people and, and it is confusing. I, I, I agree. It's, it is a confusing topic when you have to start adding the decibels to it, which is why I, I like what Blake said. I, the, I completely the... understand. Although I do want to say, I completely understand um, Brian's number, uh, Brian's reasoning too, because He's right. Amplifiers are voltage sources. I get that. I do get that. I just, when I'm comparing speakers, it just makes it easier for people that are comparing speakers to look at that number and be like, okay, at one watt, this is what it does. Especially since I think most people are going off of when they're buying drivers are going off wattage versus voltage. Right. Right. They're looking at wattage. So uh, there was a comment earlier. Someone had asked if I had made the decision to pull the uh, backseat out of my truck and start putting some big subwoofers in there. I want to address that real quick and just say oh, that I'm currently oh. pricing aftermarket alternators. You okay, oh. Nick? Nick's, Nick's camera yeah. just went off crazy and he yelled out in pain. So like maybe a camera fell on him or something. No, I was um, excited for what you said. So I'm currently pricing out high output alternators and I've got a big three kit sitting in a box that uh, high five Vega sent me. So uh, all I need is to get the alternator and a shorter belt. And I'm, so I'm trying to figure out who I want to get my alternator from. Um, I don't live too far from at least two companies that make them. And I would love to see if someone would be willing to, you know, I'll pay for the alternator if they'll like do a video with me where I can pick up the, uh, pick up the alternator from them, interview them, talk to them, make some content out of it. And that's kind of why I'm gaming for it. So I will, uh, uh, and it's not so much the SPL bug. It is the fact that I'm now at a point where I'm kind of testing out subwoofers a lot and it's, it's just not good to test subwoofers sitting on the back seat. It looks bad. <laughs> it does. It looks bad. It makes me look stupid when I do it. So I, it's just more of a um, modifying the daily driver so that I can make better content as opposed to trying to be into big SPL builds. Yeah, that'll be actually pretty cool. I'm actually interested in that. Yeah, there's a lot of alternator brands out there. Uh, from what I gather, they're all just taking standard cases they get from a junkyard or something and rebuilding them. So, hey, what's up with saying you're going to keep that comment up for the rest of the day? Well, someone else had a better joke, and and then people just keep making good comments. Um, mm, okay. And there was a super chat, so we'll bring it back up then. There you go. That's. <laughs> hey, I got this. Qu I I think Brian's got a good question. Do you just swap out the alternator or? Do other adjustments need to be made to the car's electrical system? 
So this is out of my area of expertise. So I'm kind of shooting in the dark. It's going to depend on the car. There are some cars with external voltage regulators. And if your vehicle has an external voltage regulator, then all that extra juice your alternator is putting out is never going to show up as more voltage. So that's one issue. So that's a, a big thing. Um, you probably need a smaller belt and a big three, because if you're going to be pumping out, a, I mean, my vehicle uses a fused link, um, for uh, its fuse between the alternator and the battery. And if you run 300 amps from a high output alternator along that fuse link, it'll melt. So you do need, uh, you, you do need upgraded wires and a, and a shorter belt at the very least. Um, and from there, it's gonna be real car specific. So someone had asked, um, do we use uh, QMS, QES and QTS separate? And, and we do. Uh, another one, though, that I want to throw out there that a lot of people uh, don't use, depending on what you're looking to do, is MMS. Uh, MMS is the combination of the weight of the cone assembly plus the driver uh, radiation mass load. So basically, it's it's the weight, right? Is that uh, the moving MMS is at the moving mass of the suspension? The moving mass. Yes. And so... MMS is moving mass. Okay. If, if you're looking for something that can be tighter and more controlled, a lower moving mass can be uh, beneficial. So uh, that's why some people really like, um, a, like, uh, like certain drivers, certain types of drivers and things like that, like planar, for example, like planar, like these are planar headphones. So um, planars have a very low moving mass. So technically they should be able to start and stop a lot faster than some other drivers. Yes. Yes. So lightweight drivers are, are better in that regard. Can, can be. Yeah. Yep. And, and this is what Blake is saying. It's very important for higher frequencies in general with 3000 asterisks. <laughs> lower MMS is better for tweeters and mid range. Right. Right. Smaller moving mass. Well, it should be a smaller moving mass. It's got a smaller cone. So, yeah, and and that's why I said for certain drivers and certain applications, right? You know, it, it all depends on what you're trying to do. But a lower MMS, especially, like I said, that's why some people really like planar style, either headphones or planar tweeters is because they, they have a very low moving mass. All right, Nick, I'm looking at the clock and we have been at it for an hour. So tell me, what do you have coming up on your channel or coming up in your uh, in your world that you want to share with us and give us a heads up on? Um, so I just finished recording the technical videos on the uh, the epic build. So some people wanted to know a little bit more about the what's and the why's. And so that's basically what that is. You know, what did I do? Why did I do it type of thing? Uh, I'm not going over everything. Uh, if you want to go into even more detail than I did, then you're probably going to want to become a patron. That's just uh, where we kind of do a lot of the more behind the scenes stuff that's not in the videos, but it will kind of explain to you why did I do a TMM? Why did I choose two of the woofers versus one? You know, those types of things. Why did I choose the CSS tweeter along with those drivers? Those types of things that... Um, you know, that are good questions and they weren't really answered in the video. So uh, we'll go on that. I don't know when that's going out. I just recorded it today. I haven't even got a chance to edit it or get sit down to edit it. So that's going to be, you know, where, where I'm at there. And then, uh, I'm starting on a dual subwoofer build. And so that I'm going to start working on in my garage, hopefully sometime this week. Awesome. Awesome. I, uh, I, I'm backed up with the projects that I need to work on and half of them I have the parts for laying out here. <laughs> um, but I do have a build that I just finished. I've shown you a couple of pictures of that build tonight that should be coming out soon with, with a little bit of luck. I might get the video edited before Sunday, but I doubt it. So I will probably be editing that video this coming weekend. And then the following week, that video will be out. As always, I try to drop my videos as early as possible so that my for my patrons so they can get a preview of it. Yesterday, I dropped my polyfill video, which uh, made some controversial claims about the effectiveness of polyfill. 
And my conclusion is that the idea that you're going to stick polyfill in a box and make the box bigger. Yeah, sure. Kind of a little bit, but I don't think it's enough to make it work, uh, make it make it worthwhile. And then, of course, the debate in the comments is, yeah, but it sounds better. But not many people have actually shown me a large scale like A-B testing. You know, does this sound better than that? So we'll see if that video gets a lot of views. I might do some extra testing, but probably not. <laughs> Yeah. And so here's the deal. Um, we, we obviously had some disagreement in that, and that really depends on how much you're stuffing, how big of a difference it makes. And it, it doesn't necessarily make a huge difference, but there can be benefits, especially if you're limited on size and other reasons why you may or may not want to do it. And yeah, maybe you want to do more testing and things of that nature. Uh, I, Someone started off the show saying, did I use polyfill? And the answer is yes, I do use polyfill quite often. I also use other things. Um, in my latest build, in the Epic Hi-Fi build, I actually use uh, rock wool. I had some leftover for that. So, you know, those types of things I use. Baba, Baba <laughs> thank you very much for coming up here at the end as we're about to wrap it off. Um, and yes, James, I was actually using pillow stuffing from Walmart. Um, uh, literally, it was pillow stuffing from Walmart. <laughs> yeah, you can buy them in bags. I, I have a whole yeah. bag in there. You can buy them from uh, like Walmart. You can buy it from, you don't have to use the stuff that says acoustic on it. By the way, the acoustic stuff is more expensive and it just says acoustic. There's like no difference between, you know, like if it's if it's just basic polyfill, just go buy pillow stuffing from Walmart or buy it from uh, like Hobby Lobby or I, I don't know, whatever the other Joanne's fabrics, right. whatever the other fabric stores are. And I'm, I'm open to doing some more testing, but what I have found is that when you go down the rabbit hole of doing that testing, each time you do more tests, you take fewer people down the rabbit hole with you. And so if I get two or three videos into like tech, I made too many game, uh, game setting videos. And by the time I finished the, everything I wanted to do for how to set the game, people had stopped watching them. So, um, and I think Brian's right. You know, most of the time when you use a lot of the, the stuffing it's good for dampening resonances and I, I touched this a little on the video that's coming out uh you can see resonances and one of the best tools to easily see resonances is is dats you can actually see the resonance is in your impedance response if you have them and then just by adding some polyfill or something else you can actually hopefully dampen those down especially um, any internal standing waves or anything of that nature what oh it is magical <laughs> it's all magic right. <laughs> all right i'm gonna hit the in broadcast button before the uh before the comments get too far out of hand <laughs> i think that's a good good call all right guys that's a good we're gonna end right there on that ladies and gentlemen thank you for coming to watch i am out out see you guys